Global Evangelistic Center here in Kissimmee, Florida. This morning I have a powerful message for you in your Bibles. The book of Revelation, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Revelation, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Reading, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. What a glorious revelation John has testified to experiencing a glorious revelation while in the spirit about the throne of God and the one who sat on the throne. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, unless you are a jeweler or happen to have a, <laughs> a jewelry piece with a jasper in it, most people probably do not know what a jasper stone looks like. Amen? But it is described as an opaque, meaning it's not able to be seen through, not transparent, stone that is usually either red, yellow, brown, or green in color, and rarely blue. Uh, rarely blue. The, 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 the most common being a reddish-brown color, which is due to iron inclusions in the stone. Now, now, now the sardine stone is a gem of a blood-red color that is most often described to be like a carnelian, which is a brownish-red mineral more commonly used as a semi-precious gemstone and is a brownish red mineral. The contemporary English version of the Bible actually uh, translates Revelation 4 and 3 as Jasper and Carnelian. The one uh, who was sitting there, it reads, sparkled like precious stones of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Now, the sardine stone was also called sardius because it was obtained from Sardis in the ancient kingdom of Lydia and Sardius. Uh, is also enumerated, this stone, among the precious stones in the high priest breastplate. But when you think about this, what a glorious sight to behold of the true majestic splendor and glory of our enthroned Savior. Oh, hallelujah! <laughs> John the Revelator further goes on to testify about our Lord in his glorified state in a prophecy that is fully in sync with what Daniel saw as he saw the enthroned ancient of days in Daniel 7 and 9. Daniel 7 and 9, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. <laughs> like pure 
wool. Hmm. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Now John the Revelator goes on to testify about our Lord in his glorified state that he appeared unto him, John, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. <laughs> Revelation 1, chapter 12 to 15. He described the hairs of his head as white, like white wool, uh, like snow, Sister Ormi, Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. And while she's coming, I'll tell you that I'm teaching from a series on the battle of the universal trinities, good versus evil. <laughs> and my message title this morning, which is really an introduction, is the... Is, um, Ethnicity and the reality of God. Ethnicity and the reality of God. This is the introduction, Sister Omi. Revelation 1, verses 12 to 15. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, like wool. as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass. Read that again. His feet were like fine brass. One more time. <laughs> his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. All right. There is also uh, another major but often overlooked or not discussed point that is apparent about John's revelation about our gloriously enthroned Savior, and that is his revelation about the Lord's physical characteristics and the glory surrounding him. Now, I'm no... Uh, anthropological scientist and I certainly was not there to see Jesus in the flesh for myself but just from these descriptions alone there seems to be uh, something a little bit off with the centuries old Anglo-Saxon description of a blonde hair and blue-eyed Jesus even if it is just from that data alone. Amen? Any logical thinking person must conclude that either the physical characteristics attributed to the divine personage that John has seen in his vision is a description of him in his glorified state and thus our definition of ethnicity Ethnicity as we know it is not applicable to this divine person as manifested glory does not reflect ethnicity. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Or, or, or we must conclude that even in Christ's glorified state, there is still the remnant of the physical traits and characteristics of his person as was witnessed by his disciples upon his resurrection. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43. Papa, get ready to read that one for me. Now, uh, Christ's glorious resurrection. Thank God for it. It is the central item of the gospel and what makes the unique difference 
between our faith <laughs> and all other religions. Up from the grave he arose. Oh, with a mighty triumph over his foes. After his disciples found the tomb empty, Jesus made a series of appearances to the disciples. Now, he was not immediately recognizable, but the apostle Luke testified that he was not a ghost. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43. Papa V. The word of God as is recorded in Luke 24, verses 36 to 43. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to, to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. You know, I, as an island man, I get excited every time I read that. Because it means that we're going to be able to eat boiled fish in our resurrected body. <laughs> but but uh, so we see that Christ in his glorified state still maintained the key physical characteristics of his begotten humanity. Even including his ability to eat. So then the vision of his glowing bronze feet refined in the fire, yes, they, they have a parabolic significance of the purity of his holiness with the vision of his feet representing his authority and dominion. But they can also give testimony to the actual physical appearance of Christ as was witnessed by all that saw him. Amen? But, uh, but uh, lest I be labeled as an eisegetical preacher, that is, um, one of them preachers that be interpreting scripture <laughs> with my own ideas and my own bias rather than the actual meaning of the text, let us look for other corroborating text or evidence of my statement. Amen? We can certainly get technical about it with the forensic evidence left on the Shroud of Turin cloth that is so widely believed to be the burial cloth of our precious Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMasiah. The evidence showed and shows that the man on the Shroud can be assigned a specific racial grouping. According to ethnologist Carlton Kuhn, this man that was wrapped in the Shroud of Turin is of a physical type found in modern times among uh, Sephardic Jews and noble Arabs. Ethnology is the study of the characteristics of various peoples and differences in relationships between them. Dr. Coons was a well-respected American physical anthropologist. He was a no-fly-by-night fella. He was a professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania, a lecturer and professor at Harvard, and president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Regarding the racial grouping of the man whose body the shroud of Turin wrapped, Dr. Coons further narrowed the racial grouping down even further. For his beard and hairstyle were common among 
ancient Jews, but nowhere else in the Roman Empire. In fact, on the back image of the man, we see what looks like an unbound pigtail. This is a very distinctive Jewish feature, for it was a specific fashion among first century Jews. Now, what you got to understand is that Sephardic Jews are the Jews of Spain, Portugal, North Africa, and the Middle East. And their descendants, oh, we see them all across America and South and Central America today. Sephardic Jews are often subdivided into Sephardim from Spain and Portugal, and Mizraham from the Northern Africa and Middle East. The Bible says that the Jewish priesthood, the Kohenim, began 3,000 years ago when God anointed Aaron, brother of Moses, to be Israel's high priest. A DNA genetic study of modern day Kohenim has provided the first scientific evidence supporting the oral tradition of an ancient priestly lineage. Statistically, the Lemba people from Southeast Africa are more Jewish than European Jews. In particular, Lemba clan, known as the Baba clan, 53% of the males carry the unique DNA signature of Jewish priest. Males from the Lemba tribe carry a higher incidence of the Jewish priestly DNA signature than the European and American Jewish population. The Lemba carry a DNA sequence that is distinctive to the Kohenim, a hereditary set of Jewish priests. More than half of the men in a Lemba elite family contain the same genetic marker on the Y chromosome as the one found in a study of Kohenim, the priest. Male Jews who claim to be descended from the Jewish priestly line of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Black Jews, as we call them, were in Africa 1,300 years before the birth of Christianity and at least 1,800 years before the birth of Mohammed. God has always had a special love for the sons of Kush and Ethiopia, which when we understand the geographical history of the land, is a message to all of the sons and to all of the daughters of the continent. He asked the rhetorical question through the prophet Amos. In Amos chapter 9, verse 7. People of Israel, are you any different from the Ethiopians to me? Ask Adonai. True, I brought Israel up from Egypt, but I also brought the Philistines from Kephtor. Hmm. That's a division of the ancient Egypt. And Aram, that's present day central Syria, from Kir. It's identified with uh, later biblical history. That would be al Karak, which is a city in Jordan. Hmm. Now, I'm not here to give an ethnological or racially empowering message or speech, but to bring truth to a current day issue that the devil has strategically used for centuries to subjugate, to bring dominion or control to a whole class of people. The main focus of the end time warfare between good and evil will be led by the devil's selfish ambition to steal the worship that belongs to God and to God alone. The simple truth of the matter 
is that God is a God that loves all people. And as John also prophetically reveals, the final end time and eternal state for those of us that fear God and do what is right and acceptable unto him, that state will be one where there is not any racial division. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. After this, I looked, and there before me was a huge crowd, too large for anyone to count, from every nation, from every nation, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding branches in their hands, and they shouted, Victory to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah. That's a joyous sight to even think about when black people and white people when, as they say, red people or brown people, when we get beyond this foolishness that divides us and come prostrate before God and worship the Lamb. But we must understand that there will be warfare before we get to that stage of ultimate glory, before we get to that stage of worship, and this warfare will be focused on the personhood of the blessed Holy Trinity. By the satanic trinity, it'll be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost against Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The personhood of the individual persons of the trinity will be where the end time battle will be fought. To stop the culture of worship and subsequent Shekinah glory of God from filling the temple of his praise. The issue of ethnicity, race, and the reality of God is a very important issue in our present time. And just like the other key topics of God's personhood, like gender, where we see that a battle is currently raging to spoil the purity of Christ's bride, to the issue of God's divine prerogative and other key areas, but the issue of ethnicity and the reality of God is one where the enemy has waged a strategic warfare over the centuries we are now fully in a season that i prophesied a decade ago that there would be an intensification of racism hmm. Hmm. this morning i want to start a series that will focus on the issue of race and christianity Black Jesus or white Jesus? <laughs> While ethnic, now, now I'm intentionally not using the term racial. While ethnic harmony and universal praise is really what God desires from all mankind, the fact of the matter is that this goal has been derailed by the devil who has used the white supremacist and uh, black supremacist, because we got racism on both sides of the fence, to raise the issue of Christ ethnicity as a major point to divide us. Now the white supremacist, the white supremacist has tried to raise this issue by erasing the genealogical history of the Messiah and his people 
to reestablish a foundation of white supremacy based on a Caucasian messiah. Uh, but uh, don't get too happy because the black supremacist has done no better <laughs> as they have tried to elevate a geographical and genealogical truth to establish a foundation of black supremacy based on a black messiah. <laughs> Jesus didn't drive a pickup truck and he didn't wear an African dashiki. <laughs> now while I believe that we are able through science and recorded history, the history of the Jewish people, to determine what ethnicity our savior may have been, the truth is not as simple. Or put another way, the truth is not as black and white as we have been acculturated or brainwashed to think. <laughs> French physician Francois Bernier was the first person to use the word race as a category for classifying humans in 1684 in a essay titled, A New Division of the Earth, According to the Different spe Species or Races of Men Who Inhabit It. History also shows us that before the African slave trade boom in the 18th century, between one half and two thirds, and this is interesting, of all early white immigrants to the American colonies were non free laborers. Initially, European settlers in the colonies gave blacks from Africa and Native Americans the same status as white indentured servants. But by the 1700s, however, Africans and their children were treated as a different race and were viewed as lifelong properties of their masters. Now it is uh, from true science we see the widely held truth about the issue of skin complexion that geography and ultraviolet rays cause variation in skin color not race. Skin color is due primarily to the presence of a pigment called melanin, which is controlled by at least six genes. Both light and dark complexioned people have melanin. Just how melanin is normally located in the epidermis or the outer skin layer, the issue of race and racial division is an extremely superficial way to separate a people. Understanding the science of complexion, we see that dark skin is merely a description of complexion and not a statement of race. Race and racial segregation is a man-made invention. I got to say that again. Race and racial segregation is a man-made invention. It goes against the word of God. Acts chapter 17 verse 26 tells us from one, from one man, he made every nation. From one man, he made every nation living on the entire surface of the earth and he fixed the limits of their territories and the periods when they would flourish spirituality has no color christ in his pre-incarnate state was the word and thus just like the father and the Holy Spirit, he was in a spiritual form. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. <laughs> but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, <laughs> to redeem them that were under the law. 
Galatians chapter 4. <laughs> and because ye are sons, there's no racial distinction there, God has sent forth the spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Abrahamic covenant, which is the foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith, was to a covenant people, not to a complexion-defined race. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Sister Sonia, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is so important because it shows that the covenant of God that was given so long ago is still in effect today. Genesis 12, 1, 1 to three. 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go for yourself, away from your country, from your relatives and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. Hold right there. That's the promise of land. Mm -hmm. And I make of you a great nation. That's the promise of descendants. <laughs> and I will bless you and make your name famous. That's the promise of great respect and fame. And distinguish, hmm. and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. Cool, right there, that's the promise of being blessed and being a special blessing to all who bless them. This is our inheritance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and curse him who curses or uses insolent language towards you. <laughs> In the, 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 hold it right there. Because this blessing comes from God in his capacity as our defender. That all who curse us will be cursed. Amen. In you will all the families and kindred of the earth be blessed. Now, now, thank you, Sister Sonia. This is a covenant with a people and not a race as we know it. History shows us that the climatic condition of the land where the original Hebrew people lived in would have created the conditions for a darker colored people. And scientists believe that Geography and ultraviolet rays cause variation in skin color, not race. So historically, the assignment of race to our ancient Jews, the prophets, the kings, the shepherds, historically assigning a Caucasian ethnicity to biblical individuals has been a mostly subjective practice. In other words, History depends on the people that write it. Based on cultural stereotypes and societal trends and hidden agendas rather than on scientific methods. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not a message for the empowerment of any group. I'm not here to empower any group of people over the other. <laughs> Because as we have seen, that is not God's desire. Because his love is universal. His love is a universal love. For God so loved the world. He didn't say for God so loved just America. Or God so loved just uh, the Bahamas. Or God so loved just Albania. Or God so loved just Israel. Or God so loved Egypt. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. I'm a whosoever. But have everlasting life. But uh, l l let me tell you something though. We got a war going on. There is an evangelical war that is raging out there for young black men by the Muslims. We have to make sure that we are armed with not just the power of intercession, 
It's fine to pray, but you got to have the substance of truth to address these situations. We have to be also armed with historical and factual truth. Muslims make up about 6% of the population in the United States. The majority of these conversions that are taking place, the majority of conversions to this growing religion is occurring within the African American community, which is a little over 11% of America's population. Many African Americans view Christianity as the white man's religion and they associate conversion to Islam with recovering their ethnic heritage. But the truth of the matter is that there were no blonde hair and blue eyed Hebrew people in the beginning of the Hebrew story in Egypt, the land of Ham. Ham now in Hebrew means black, hot, and burnt. Even if there were ancient Hebrews with a fairer complexion, come now, they didn't have sunscreen back then. After centuries of slavery in the sun, most of them would have been black, hot, and burnt. Now Ham had four sons. Now, you know why Ham is important? Because the fancy racist theological footwork involved in trying to make Ham, because he is considered to be the progenitor of the black race. But they have tried to rewrite history by saying that he is the progenitor of the dark race. Is there really a difference? But black is a recent title, even according to the one drop rule, which is a sociological and legal principle of racial classification that was historically prominent in the United States, asserting that any person with even one ancestor of sub-Saharan African ancestry, one drop of black blood, <laughs> is considered to be black. This is by their own terms. Ham had four sons. He had Cush, from whence came the Ethiopians, the Cushites, and the Nubians. He had Mizraham, from whence came Egyptians and Kemet. He had Foot, ancient Libyans and Somalians. And he had Canaan, Canaanite the original inhabitants of the land of Israel. All four of Ham's sons and their descendants settled in and around the continent of Africa. This includes the so-called Middle East, which is also a part of the continent of Africa. Ham's sons are the people of the African continent. The ancient Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Somalians, and the Canaanites. <laughs> Our scriptures, archaeological findings, and many Egyptologists, and just our plain common sense, confirm for us that the Egyptians during biblical times were a dark colored people, and since the biblical Egyptians were a dark-skinned people. Joseph was most probably a dark-skinned person also. If he were a white-skinned person, his brothers would have easily recognized him. <laughs> but he blended in with the dark-skinned Egyptians. But Joseph's brothers thought he was another Egyptian. Besides that, Israel and Egypt are next door neighbors, so they experience the same climatic conditions. Geographically, Israel is on the border of Africa and Sinai and is in the continent of Africa. The original heritage of the Hebrew people was not 
and Anglo-Saxon one. And in this truth we find synchronicity and a greater depth of meaning. <laughs> in Daniel's ancient of days prophecy, there is no doubt that this is a topic that causes great discomfort because of the many years of ethnic brainwashing that has placed religious stereotypes and icons in places globally. But if we, the blood-washed church, is ever to effectively address the problem of racism and its revival on the streets, we have to be armed with the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, we are not ignorant of his devices. God wants to manifest his Shekinah glory in our present age. But we must not let the devil continue to succeed in his plans to bring a revival of racism and to keep the old systems in place that upheld it for so long. Psalm 96 verses 1 to three, it says, sing to Adonai a new song. Sing to Adonai all, all, all the earth. Sing to Adonai, bless his name. Proclaim his victory day after day. Declare his glory. Among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. The fact of the matter is that us rushing to hold hands, us rushing to go singing kumbaya, and us rushing to plan emotional events like tearful feet washing, or even making grand declarations that ain't going to bring no reconciliation because a blanket of sorry cannot mask the problem that we have. Only the unadulterated word of God and the acknowledgement of truth can do that. 21st century kingdom living and dominion demands that we broaden our horizons. But too many people will respond in a negative way when we attempt to truthfully address this topic. <laughs> Listen to some of the stuff you'll hear them say. I'm not prejudiced, nor do I practice discrimination. So why are you bringing up a topic that does not affect me? Oh, you'll hear him say, geez, just get over it already. This is no longer an acceptable response because it ignores the generational privilege caused by the unjust system of slavery and socioeconomic discriminatory practice. The fact of the matter is that we have a systematic system of slavery still well in effect today. There is an age-old systematic system of discrimination and unjust entitlement that operates with the same Egyptian spirit that conspired against the Hebrew children in Exodus. True freedom will never come unless we, like Moses, Open our eyes to the truth of our identity and allow God's glory to cleanse us in the wilderness and to lead us to the promised land of the fulfillment of our destiny. The big picture is that Babylon has erased the Judaic heritage of the dispersed people of Zion 
causing them to become so entangled within her systems that they have so comfortably adopted her culture and worship <laughs> because most of them do not know who they are. It will be difficult for them because they have become so entangled even as they watch Babylon collapse. But the word of God is the same yesterday as it is today. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 51 verse 6 says to flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her her recompense. Saints of God, it's no doubt that the heart of God has been grieved as he has watched the church's participation in propagating racism and in endorsing slavery as an institution of God to deliver heathen savages from a devil-worshipping culture <laughs> to really bring them to a land where they can be dehumanized and engrafted into subservience. But we are now in a season where the distortion of the gospel to uphold racial superiority will no longer hold the minority in place. Because God's mandate of praise from a united body of different people will be greater than any racist agenda. <laughs> some, some will say, it's that race thing again. <laughs> but this is a statement that presupposes that we have successfully dealt with the issue of race and that things are just hunky-dory. <laughs> well, there is no way we can deceive ourselves to believe that that race thing has been uh, resolved when in America young black men are 21 times more likely to be killed by cops than young white men. <laughs> this is according to the pro publia analysis of data. Even the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also show that people of color are more likely to be killed by cops overall. Yes, it's that race thing again. When race, hatred, speech by desperate politicians call for the hunting down of immigrants like in the days of Germany's anti-Semitism. <laughs> even ignoring the 40 million immigrants currently estimated to be in the United States. And all of this to thunderous applause. Yes, it's that race thing again. We realize then that race thing has never really gone away. Hear me well, people in the islands of the sea, where our watchmen on the wall need to hear God's word. Where are our watchmen on the walls that will sound the alarm of truth, that will sound the alarm of revelation? The enemies of Judah have become strategically entrenched within our Caribbean. And if the watchman so far does not sound and Judah's dispersed do not awaken, then the noose that the enemy has fastened around the region of our nations will economically and spiritually kill us. Ezekiel 3 and 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, Hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. The deception of the white watch gospel has fueled an apathetic 
and generally ignorant spiritual state for many of those in the islands of the sea. But there is a new season of awakening coming for Zion's dispersed people in these end times. Amidst adversity and a season of desolation, they will awaken as Isaiah prophesied to glorify the Lord. Isaiah 24 and 15. Wherefore, glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea. Healing and forgiveness cannot take place unless we confess our sins. You see, we want to jump to saying sorry, but we do not want to confess what we did. Brother Des, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. What good is saying, I'm sorry. And then when I ask you, what are you sorry for? Um, for whatever. No, no. When wrong is not corrected, it becomes the sinful standard. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant Hold and right mercy. There. This is covenant. <laughs> and this is a generational reference. Go ahead, bro. For them that love him and observe his commandments. <clears throat> Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept thy commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. <laughs> Breaking <coughs> the generational curse by confession and true repentance. I and my father's house have sinned. One of the most popular scriptures for communion is 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. Confession, repentance, restitution, restoration. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves. Too many people are in a state of being deceived. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, you see a lot of people are afraid to confess the sin because they realize that when it comes time to confess the sin, there must be restitution made. I don't, I don't think I'm going after your money because God has blessed me. I don't want my 50 acres and a mule. No. I'm talking biblical principle here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. How can you be forgiven unless you confess? Sorry, just don't cover it. I don't care who creates a grand declaration. We are so sorry for the sins of the past. <laughs> now, let's just move on. No, we got to say what really happened. This thing is systematic. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We got to confess our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
some unrighteousness we don't even realize we have, but we got right down in our heart. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. <laughs> My God. You know, a lot of people, they go through the process of just jumping to sorry and not saying what they are sorry for. Healing cannot take place by you just taking a blanket, the blanket called sorry, and just whoosh. Let's just cover that. Now let's just move on. While the victim is saying, wait, hold up. Hold up. We got some incidents here that you got to realize what you did because wrong was never corrected, so it has become the standard. We got some dehumanized people that think they are dirt, that still think they are less than humans and don't realize that they are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. God never intended for us to have no races. The Bible does not talk about race. You know what it talks about? Culture. Because God wanted a culture to come from his people. A culture of priests that know how to lead worship. <laughs> how can we sing? He's got the whole world in his hands. And let me be real, some places, they don't even want to hold your hand because they think that black will rub off. <laughs> My God, I have to hold your hand. <laughs> Race is man-made. Rebuke that demon. It's in every one of us. I thought about it. I said to myself, My God, if I live back in the Bible days, I probably would have been talking about John the Baptist. Who's that insect-eating fella? <laughs> I ain't go. I don't, I, I'm not going over by John the Baptist's house because he gonna serve locusts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can easily get prejudice. It can easily creep into you. You got to confess it before you can get over it. So this morning, I want us to all take a deep look into our own hearts because healing must come from us before it flows to them. And check yourself. The thing is a demon and a principality. And in Jesus' name, we have to rebuke it. Please stand. <laughs> 